And now we are going to investigate the boundaries, the intersection between uh, art, fashion, uh, wearable computing with uh, uh, the associate professor of MIT Media Lab directing uh, the ILO Tech uh, uh, group. Please welcome Professor Leah Buckley. I don't know if I misspelled the word. Buckley is fine. Okay, Leah, welcome. So, the first woman of the Maker Fair. Yes. That's an honor. Okay, bonjour. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. It's really a delight uh, to be here in this beautiful place. Um, taking part uh, of this wonderful, wonderful community. Um, so like uh, the speakers before me, I wanted to talk to you today about making. Um, and I really see making, I think, uh, much like the previous speaker, as an essential part of being human. So I think that people, in the same way we feel compelled to kind of drink and eat and uh, procreate, um, we also feel compelled to make things. It's just part of what we do and, and what we love and, and what makes us human beings. Um, so making, of course, what a lot of us are here today to celebrate, making is about technology and engineering and science. Um, but I wanted to also remind you that it's also about design and art and craft and craftsmanship. That making is about uh, innovation, it's about problem solving and utility and contributing something useful to the world, it's about commerce and capitalism. But it's also and equally important about kind of beauty and truth and poetry um, about things that are mysterious and delightful and wondrous. Um, and I think this, this gorgeous and ancient city is a wonderful setting to help us remember these dual sides of making. So in my work, kind of in my uh, life at the Media Lab, I've tried to unite these two sides of making. And so what I'm going to talk to you today is about some of that work, uh, a few projects that have taken place in my research group over the years. Now, there are two uh, perspectives that my students and I have taken on making. And they really dovetail well with kind of Mark's talk and what he was talking about, kind of making, on the one hand, making objects. So we are, of course, makers. I myself am a, make, am a maker. I love to make objects, to put things together and contribute stuff to the world. Um, but we also really love to help other people make things. And so I think of that as we are acting as makers of experiences for other people. So we also make tools, um, we make activities, um, and we do all sorts of things to try to help other people become makers and creators. So I wanted to start by talking to you about some of the ways that we make experiences. And I'm going to share just a couple, a few projects with you along these lines. Um, so the first uh, project is about uh, uh, an area called electronic textiles. This is about how you combine electronics and computation with fabric to make wearable uh, computers. Um, so this is a project that I've actually been working on for quite a while now, uh, a project called the LilyPad Arduino. So the LilyPad Arduino is a toolkit for blending electronics and computation uh, and fabric to make interactive fashions and other things. This is actually about exactly the fifth anniversary of this toolkit um, this fall, so that was a, that was a fun coincidence here. Um, what you can see in this slide here are some of the pieces of the LilyPad Arduino toolkit, so there are lights and motors and sensors, and then you can stitch them together with electrically conductive thread. Um, so this kit has been out on the market, uh, again, for about five years. Here's just a snapshot of some of the projects that people out in the world, like yourselves, perhaps, have been making uh, with that toolkit. So it's been 
really fun for me to see how others have used this set of tools. Um, more recently, we've been really excited about finding ways to engage more young people um, in the LilyPad Arduino, and in particular, using it as a way to introduce young people to art and design and engineering and computing. Um, so here is kind of the audience we'd really like to engage more. Um, and so with this audience in mind, along with um, some of my students and a wonderful designer, we've been writing a book um, that will actually be uh, uh, available at the end of this month that is a book uh, of LilyPad Arduino projects and activities um, called So Electric that is really designed to reach this audience of young people and educators and so on. So this is a relatively new project that I worked on with Kanjun Q uh, and Sonia DeBoer that I'm really excited about. So if any of you are interested, if you're an educator, or you just want to play with textiles and electronics, I urge you to check this guy out. So that's one way that we design experiences for other people. So we build toolkits, and we also design activities and kind of publish them. Um, another way that we like to share uh, the making experience with others is through open source hardware. Um, so now I'm going to tell you about a project that my student, David Mellis, who's actually here, um, so you can ask him more about this project uh, after my talk. Um, but to tell you more about a project that he's been working on, exploring how you can empower people to build their own electronic devices. So we live in this world where we're surrounded by things like radios and televisions and cell phones. Wouldn't it be cool if we could make those things for ourselves? Um, so he has been exploring how to empower people to do that. Um, so this is one of his latest projects. This is a build your own cell phone. Um, this is showing the guts of this do-it-yourself uh, cell phone. This is a circuit board, the assembled circuit board uh, of a make-your-own-cell-phone make uh, prototype. Um, here's Dave's finished cell phone. Um, I should mention that this has been his full-time main phone for the last nine months or so, so this really works, um, takes some serious abuse. Um, and what's especially cool is you really can make your own one of these if you're interested. Just go to Dave's website, and all of the hardware and software is available um, open source for you to hack and tinker and play with. So in addition to making this device and sharing the design files in an open source way, um, Dave has taught a series of workshops where he invited people to the lab to make their own phones. So I just wanted to show you some of those uh, variations and kind of those hacks on his uh, original design. So here uh, are a couple of people actually after the workshop kind of calling each other for the first time and having that delight of like, ah, oh, it works. Um, here are uh, two variations. The one on the left, uh, you'll notice that the uh, LCD screen is replaced by an LED screen. The one on the right is a, is a beautiful phone where the case uh, is carved out of a purple heart wood. Here is a version uh, with a 3D printed case. Uh, and here is a version, this is one of my very favorite, where you can see the person um, sketch their own really kind of delightful and personal interface. Um, so again, if you want to make your own phone, I encourage you to check out uh, Dave's website and also talk to him because he's here at the fair this week. So I wanted to share uh, a final project that explores kind of empowering other people to make stuff. Um, and this project takes place in the space of computational design, by which I mean writing computer programs to generate objects, to generate physical objects. Um, so my student, Jennifer Jacobs, has been working on a programming environment called Dress Code. And the basic idea is that you have a programming environment, like any other programming environment, and you write code 
and then you compile that code. But the output of that code is a design for a uh, piece of fashion, for a garment, or an accessory, or another kind of beautiful visual object. So when you write your code and you compile it, what you see on the left-hand side of your screen is your design uh, for that uh, fashion object. In this case, a shirt with this beautiful kind of lacy decoration in the middle. Um, so Jennifer has been using, kind of developing this tool and then also using it as a way to introduce young people to programming and design. Um, and kids and other novices have made just some gorgeous uh, set of objects using this programming language and environment. So here are uh, a couple of young people who made uh, laser-cut scarves. This is, the next image is from a more uh, recent workshop. This is a t-shirt where the pattern, the screen printed pattern there was generated from the programming uh, environment. This is a program that the young man uh, who is wearing the t-shirt wrote to generate that pattern. Here's another t-shirt from that same workshop. Um, and then finally, this is a, a snapshot from another workshop where the young people um, had the opportunity to make full garments using the, soft, the, the software. And then those garments were actually exhibited during uh, Boston's Fashion Week. So that was especially exciting and fun for the kids. Um, and that dress out in front was a dress that was generated from her uh, programming environment. OK, so I've showed you uh, several examples of how we uh, create environments and tools and activities to help support people in their making. I wanted to close by just sharing a couple of the objects then that we, as kind of primary creators, have made. Uh, start with this one. So that's uh, one of a series that another one of my absolutely brilliant students has done. Um, that was a piece done by Ji Chi. Um, if you're interested to learn more about the work and how it was made, um, you should check the documentation out on our website, which you'll see at the end of the presentation. Um, but essentially, that's a, a piece that's made entirely on paper um, with tape and traditional electronics and paper and paint, and that's about it. Um, and there are also on our website lots of tutorials that will help you make stuff like that if you're excited about it. Um, this is a project that was done actually not by a student who's officially in my group, but by kind of a, a student who we consider a member of the group um, because he's very close to us, both intellectually and kind of personally. Uh, this is a project that was done by Amit Zoran. Um, this was an exploration of how to blend traditional handcraft uh, with digital fabrication. So what might that look like and what it might mean both for digital fabrication and for craft? Um, so what he did here is he handmade a series of ceramic vases. He then broke some of them intentionally and then replaced the broken parts with digitally designed and then 3D printed lattice uh, components, that lovely kind of lacy black pieces that you see. 
in the vases. Um, this was really an exploration of how both digital fabrication and traditional craft can find kind of meaning and, uh, and connection in, in kind of new ways. How craft can bring kind of new affordances and new qualities to digital fabrication, and also how digital fabrication can connect to and relate to traditional ancient practices of making. Um, and then finally, I wanted to close with this piece, which is more kind of personal. This is a project I did in collaboration with my parents, who are um, master woodworkers. So they um, make this beautiful, curvaceous furniture. Um, and they made this beautiful, curved wooden form. And then I designed some electronics that were embedded in that form. And this is basically a simple lamp, so that the way that this works is you can, anywhere along this ribbon of wood, touch the lamp, and the light will flow out from this, the place where you're touching the lamp. And then to turn it off, you can do the same action. So you can reach out and touch the wood, and the darkness will kind of flow out from your hand. So those are some of uh, both the objects uh, and the experiences that my students and I have been working on. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Leah.